Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Bob Dodd Sunday Concert Series. We are very pleased to have with us something a little different, Greater Worcester Opera for Tripping Hither with Gilbert and Sullivan. I am Tara Hall. I am a media and program specialist here at the Framingham Public Library. It's my great pleasure to welcome to you today Greater Worcester Opera. Thank you. So welcome this afternoon to uh, the library and to the Greater Worcester Opera's performances of a variety of numbers that we're going to do for you today. We are the Greater Worcester Opera. We are a dynamic nonprofit arts organization whose mission is to present stage and concert works that feature classically and professionally trained local artists. Greater Worcester Opera provides high quality, entertaining, culturally rich productions to the audiences of central Massachusetts, while at the same time creating valuable performing opportunities for the area's wealth of talented and experienced performers who have been trained in New England's prestigious conservatories, music schools, and vocal studios. Now that you know the august uh, company in which you're sharing the room this afternoon, let me start off. So what you just heard was uh, three little maids from school from the Mikado, uh, that lively and charming song introduces three young Japanese girls, Yum Yum, Pity Sing, and Peep Bo, who are wards of the Mikado. And it was sung by uh, Lindsay, uh, by Elaine, and Carolyn. Uh, the song humorously depicted the girls as coquettish and flirtatious, showcasing their youthful charm and innocence, as if you didn't notice that. <laughs> okay. So, moving right along to the next number, we have I Am the Very Model of a Modern Major General from the Pirates of Penzance. In this iconic patter song, Ben <laughs> portrays Major General Stanley as he boasts about his vast knowledge and accomplishments in various fields. Unfortunately, none of them have to do with the military experience that he's supposed to have. Uh, known for its rapid-fire lyrics and witty wordplay, the song humorously portrays the Major General's intellect and sophistication. Thank you. 
simple as a modern mineral. I know the kings of England and I quote the fights historical from Marathon to Waterloo in order categorical. I'm very well acquainted too with matters mathematical. I understand equations both the simple and quadratical. A binomial theorem I'm teeming with a lot of news. Oh, with many cheerful facts about the square of my hypotenuse. Many cheerful facts about the square of my hypotenuse. Many cheerful facts about the square of my hypotenuse. Many cheerful facts about the square of my hypotenuse. I'm very good at integral and differential calculus. I know the scientific names of beings and a malculus. In short, in matters vegetable, animal, and mineral, I am the very model of a modern major general. Arthur's answer catalogs. I answer hot acrostics. I have a pretty taste for paradox. I quote an energetics on the crimes of Hilligabalus. In comics, I can throw peculiarities to Lamelus. I can tell him that the Raphael's from Jedidowson's Ophanes. I know the cooking chorus from the frogs of Aristophanes. Then I can have a fugue of which I fill at the music state of war. And whistle all the airs from that infernal nonsense pinafore. And Caractacus is uniform. In short, in matters vegetable, animal, and mineral, I am the very model of a modern major general. In fact, when I know what is meant by mammalin and bramelin, when I can tell at sight a Mars rifle from a javelin, when such affairs as sorties and surprises I'm more wary at, and when I know precisely what is meant by commissariat, <laughs> when I have learnt what progress has been made in modern gunnery, when I know more of tactics than a novice in a nunnery, in short, when I have a smattering of elemental strategy. <laughs> strategy. 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 Mm. Strategy. Oh, strategy. 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 Ah! You'll say I'm a major general and I'm a strategy. <laughs> Though I'm plucky and adventury, has only been locked down to the beginning of the century. But still, in matters vegetable, animal, and mineral, I am the very model of a modern major general. I think he's better qualified to do the speaking here today than I am. <laughs> just, just a quick observation. I suppose I should introduce who I am. My name is Aldo Fabrizi. I'm the music director for the Greater Worcester Opera. You will not hear me sing today. <laughs> the next number, I'm called Little Buttercup from HMS Pinafore, will be sung by Carolyn as she portrays the character known as Little Buttercup, a nickname the HMS Pinafore's crew gave her as she boards the ship, she tells us of all the curious items she sells. Carolyn. Hail, man of arms, men, safeguards of your nation. Here is an end at last of pure privation.
there'll be a test afterwards to, if anybody knows what any of those items that she was selling were, <laughs> please let us know. So, uh, moving from one big hit down to the next one, we have Poor Wandering One from the Pirates of Penzance. This aria tells the story of a young woman, Mabel, sung by Lindsay, as she and her sisters discover Rafe, who has just left his pirate indentures. Though his sisters all reject him, she offers to save him from his wandering life in this very famous aria. I know, now you have to listen to me speak after that. <laughs> for riches and rank, I do not long from Iolanthe. Okay, so let me try to untangle this little storyline for you in less than half an hour. Uh, in the Act One finale of Iolanthe, we find Phyllis, who by legal decree is supposed to marry either one of two lords from the House of Peers who have been courting her. But despite the benefits to her situation in life that such a union would provide, she's decided that the man for her is an Arcadian shepherd named Strephon. Strephon is not just a shepherd, he's also a fairy, down to the waist. <laughs> Here's the important point, fairies don't age. So, are we good so far? Are we following this? Okay, good. Unfortunately, Phyllis has just witnessed Strephon seemingly flirting with another young woman, and she feels deceived by him. He tries to explain that that young woman was his mother, who, being a fairy, doesn't age. 
So, uh, but you know, she's not having any of it. She's like, you know. So uh, now she feels she has to choose between the two lords, though her heart isn't in it. For riches and rank, I do not long for my Elanthe, Elaine. Rising in, uh, sorry, rising early in the morning from the gondoliers. This plot revolves around two gondoliers, Marco and Giuseppe, who discover that one of them is the rightful heir to the throne of Barataria. However, due to their identical appearance and the fact that they were raised together, it is initially unclear which of them is the true king. In order to solve the dilemma, they both temporarily rule the kingdom together leading to humorous situations and confusion. <laughs> In this piece, they celebrate the joys of starting their newfound day's work as royalty with enthusiasm, rising early in the morning. Ben. Then a majesty adorning in his work a day attire, we embark without delay on the duties of the day. First we polish off some batches of political dispatches and foreign politicians circumvent. Then if business isn't heavy, we may hold the royal levy or ratify some acts of parliament. Then we probably survey the household troops with the usual shallow humps and shallow hoops, or receive with ceremonial and state an interesting Eastern potentate. After that, we generally go and dress our private valet. It's a rather nervous duty. He's a touchy little man. Writes some letters literally for our private secretary. He is shaky in his feelings, so we help him if we can. Then, in view of craving dinner, we go down and order dinner. Then we polish the regalia and the coronation plate. Spend an hour into debating all our gentlemen in waiting. For the ministers of state Oh, philosophers may sing Of the troubles of a king But the duties are delightful And the privilege is great But the privilege and pleasure That we treasure beyond measure Is to run on little errands For the ministers of state After lunch, making many On a bun and glass of sherry If we've nothing in particular to do We may make a proclamation Or receive a deputation And probably create a peer or two then we help a fellow creature on his path With the garter or the thistle or the bath Then we dress and toggle off in semi-state To a festival 
Festival of Function or a Fate. After that, we stand at Sentry at the Palace Private Entry, marching here, the marching to the up and down and to and fro. While the warrior on duty goes in search of beard and beauty, and it generally happens that he hasn't far to go. He relieves us if he's able, just in time to lay the table, then we dine and serve the coffee, and at half past twelve or one. With a pleasure that's emphatic, we retire to our attic with the gratifying feeling that our duty has been done. Oh, philosophers may sing of the troubles of a king, but the pleasures that are many and of one is that are none. But the culminating pleasure that we treasure beyond measure is the gratifying feeling that our duties have been done. Oh, philosophers may sing of the troubles of a king, but the pleasures that are many and of one is that are none. But the culminating pleasure that we treasure beyond measure is the gratifying feeling that our duty has been done. Well, I really don't want to stop your, your, uh, <laughs> like you're on such a roll. What, please. <sighs> well, he gets out more words in three minutes than I do all day long. Uh, how would I play this part from the Grand Duke? Julia is an actress in Ernest Dumkoff's acting troupe and is contractually obligated to play the leading part in all of his productions. Well, there's a political coup that's about to occur in which Ernest is set to become the Grand Duke of Fenning Hopfenning, which means that Julia will have to step into the role of his wife, the Grand Duchess. He's thrilled with the idea. She, not so much. So, in this song, she describes how she would play the part of the Grand Duchess. I'll add one note to this. Uh, the setting of the Grand Duke in the is in the fictional German town of Fenning, Hauptfenning. I love saying that. <laughs> Yet, all the actors in the original production spoke with English accents, though they were playing German characters. And, however, the character of Julia is supposed to be English, but the original actress was Hungarian and spoke with a German accent. <laughs> so the English, so, so the German characters were all sung with, German, with English accents and the English person was sung with a German accent. And so if, uh, and, and, and you know, Gilbert absolutely loved the topsy-turviness of that. Uh, it's right up his alley. So uh, if you detect the German accent from Elaine today, you'll understand why. So here it is. How would I play this part from the Grand Duke?
I've got a song to sing. Oh. <laughs> From Yeoman of the Guard. Jack Point and Elsie Maynard's relationship begins as a professional one. Jack is a jester and a street performer, while Elsie is a beautiful and kind-hearted strolling singer. Their relationship develops into something a bit more as the opera unfolds, but this song from Act One is the beautiful duet which opens uh, their act, uh, the act of their traveling show. I've got a song to sing, oh, from Yeoman of the Guard, Lindsay and Ben. Another number from Yeoman of the Guard. Were I thy bride? Phoebe is in love with Colonel Fairfax, who has been imprisoned and is to be beheaded. Somehow today I feel 
envious of him. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Wilfred, is, uh, Wilfred is the Tower of London's jailer who's in love with Phoebe and encourages her to describe how life uh, would be should she be his bride. She does so in order to distract him and steal the key to Colonel Fairfax's jail cell. Sneaky. <laughs> Were I thy bride, Carolyn. A lady fair of lineage high from Princess Ida. Princess Ida was married in infancy, but has never met the boy. <sighs> ah, the good old days. <laughs> when she comes of age, rather than face her unknown groom, she runs off to start an academy for women. Curious to meet his unknown wife, Prince Hilarion brings two friends to her castle, and they dress up as women so they can find her. One of his friends finds his sister in a, is a pupil inside the castle. In this song, his sister, Lady Psyche, tells, uh, tells them what the Princess Ida has taught her students about men. Elaine, love to hear this one. <laughs> Thank you. 
alone and yet alive. I know the feeling <laughs> from the Mikado. <laughs> In this melancholic aria from the Mikado, Kat Katisha wonders why death refuses to come and bring peace to her broken heart because she has just found out that she has been spurned by the man she loves. Alone and yet alive, Carolyn. Kit Willow from the light opera The Mikado tells the story of a sorrowful dicky bird who sings willow, tit willow, tit willow until he plunges himself into the river flowing beneath his tree. <laughs> I just read the words. <laughs> the singer interprets the dicky bird's action to be the result of unrequited love and by telling the story to his beloved, threatens to succumb to the same fate should she not return his affection. <laughs> Tit Willow from the Mikado, Ben. <laughs> On a tree by a river, a little Tom Tit sang Willow, Tit Willow, Tit Willow. And I said to him, Dicky Bird, why do you sit singing willow, tit, willow, tit, willow? Is it weakness of intellect, birdie, I cried, or a rather tough worm on your little inside? With a shake of his poor little head, he replied, oh, willow, tit, willow, tit, willow. He slapped at his chest as he sat on that bough, 
singing willow, tit willow, tit willow. And a cold perspiration bespangled his brow. Oh, willow, tit willow, tit willow. He sobbed and he sighed and a gurgle he gave. Then he plunged himself into that billowy wave. And an echo rang out from the suicide's grave. Oh, willow, tit willow, tit willow. Now I'm just as sure as I'm sure that my name isn't Willow, Tint Willow, Tint Willow. Twas blighted affection that made him exclaim, Tint Willow, Tint Willow, Tint Willow. And if you remain callous and obdurate, I shall perish as he did, and you will know why. Though I probably shall not exclaim as I die. Tit willow, tit willow, tit willow. <laughs> <laughs> The next number, There is Beauty in the Bellow of the Blast, also from the Mikado, is on the surface, you know, the song seems like a lighthearted banter between two characters, but it carries a meaningful message about finding beauty in unconventional things and embracing one's unique passions. I hear chuckling behind me. <laughs> Both Katisha and Coco express their excitement for things that, are, that uh, others might consider strange or unpleasant, such as the roaring of a lion, the lashing of a tiger's tail, or the, fail, or the falling of thunderbolts. This can be interpreted as a metaphor for celebrating the unconventional and finding joy in the less apparent aspects of life. It encourages us to embrace our passions, even if they may seem odd or unconventional to others. By doing so, we can find our own unique beauty and fulfillment. That's a heavy thought for you to end <laughs> the day. So, there is beauty in the bellow of the blast from the Mikado, Ben and Carolyn.
Well, thank you so much for coming. We have one more number that we're going to do, but before we do that, I just want to uh, bring to your attention a few upcoming events that Greater Worcester Opera is going to be presenting. On uh, February 10th, which was last night, <laughs> mark this in your calendar, last night, <laughs> My editor, the yeah, crust is up. Yes. It was a great show last night. Sorry you missed it. So uh, on June 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th, we will be performing Sondheim's A Little Night Music. Fantastic show for all of you. And uh, some people up here are in this show, I believe. Yeah, so uh, if you liked what you heard today, you'll get more of it if you come to that. Again, it's at the Calliope Theater in Boylston, June 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th. We did that show a couple of years, three years ago, and we got sort of halfway through it, and then, you know, we got shut down like everybody else because of the pestilence. And so uh, we wanted to revive it and make sure that we got another good couple of weekends in because it was such a good production. So uh, please come and see it. It'll be fabulous. Uh, after that, July 10th, 17th, 24th, and 31st, we present our summer concert series, uh, and that's going to be at the Briarwood uh, Community. What's that place called? Uh, it's at Briarwood in in, in Worcester. Uh, there's a whole variety of things that we do on those four different nights. There's a Gilbert and Sullivan night. There's a Broadway night. There's a songbook, songbook night, and there's one other. I'm not sure. Yeah. Opera meets Broadway. So, depending on your tastes. <laughs> Please come to any and or all of those. They're lovely shows. And again, many of the people that are sitting on the stage right now are going to be performing with us those nights. So it would be lovely to have you there. Um, so to wrap things up, we can't really leave here without a nice rousing version of Hail Poetry from Pirates of Penzance. And if any of you know it, please stand up and sing as well. <laughs>
song of a many mad moving monk Whose soul was sad and whose glance was glum Who sipped no sup and he craved no crumb As he sighed for the love of a lady Baby, baby, misery me Lack a day he, he sipped no sup And he craved no crumb As he sighed for the love of a lady